good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the first Society London lecture in 2015, entitled Glories of Mud. My name is David Shulston, and it's a, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the president of the Society and a professor at uh, University of Newcastle, Professor David Manning. This year, 2015, has been designated by the Society as the Year of Mud, creating an opportunity for us to celebrate that most common of materials. Geologists love mud. Indeed, my own London lecture last year as president of the Society was about a mud volcano. So not only do geologists love mud, but it seems that Geological Society presidents have a particular affinity for it. Geologists love mud because it represents both an end and a beginning. It is an end because it comes at the end of this cycle of erosion and transport. And it is a beginning because during burial and diagenesis, mud changes and generates materials that we value. And we have valued throughout history. David will explore these benefits that mud brings to our well-being and pros prosperity. David's interest in rocks started early. He went on to study geology at Durham University, and he then moved to Manchester for his PhD in experimental petrology. But to keep his feet on the ground, he also did work in the China clay areas of Cornwall, and that introduced him to commercial clay geology. David then went on a postdoctoral fellowship to Manchester and Nancy, after which a new blood lectureship at Newcastle marked the beginnings of his academic career. And in 1988, he moved to Manchester. His research by then was focusing on clay diagenesis and reactions on landfill, in landfill. And in 2000, he took the chair in soil science at Newcastle University, where mud remains an integral part of his daily life. Ladies and gentlemen, Please went, welcome Professor David Manning. Thank you, David, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you in the audience for coming along on this uh, evening when there are so many other things that you could be doing to hear about mud and the glories of mud. It's a great pleasure to introduce mud to you in this lecture, and just to put everyone's mind at rest, although Mud the Musical is playing in Kuala Lumpur at the moment, we will not be singing along. There's no planned music in this uh, event this evening, although who knows what might happen in the questions at the end. Instead, I want to introduce the Year of Mud, which is a special year for the Society. It's the first time that we've designated a particular topic to a particular year, and what it has done is galvanized our science committee and those who plan our activities into addressing a common theme and you'd be quite surprised how creative some geologists can be in identifying a link with what they do and mud. So what I'm going to do is disappoint all of them because I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective of mud and give you some of the insights which make me curious about mud, interested in mud. And there will be bias in what I have to say this afternoon and there will be prominence given to those areas of mud science, if I can call it that, that interest me. And necessarily there will be other areas where people have an interest in mud, and I'll, I'll gloss over those rather, rather rapidly before I go in up to my neck. So we're going to look at mud from the point of view of where does it come from? How does it form, in other words? And what, the, what the mineralogy is that leads to, to mud as a material? Where does it go? So what happens to mud once it's formed, and then how does it go into the geological record, as David was saying, to become an important material in its own right? That leads to the third of these topics, with, which is, what is it good for? So mud, what is it good for? And all sorts of answers will come out of that, I'm quite sure. This is what we're looking at, the mud cycle, in other words. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can only go downhill from there, can't it? <laughs> But uh, there we are, I've taken the liberty, i better move on fast. So if we could just play this video, we think about where mud comes from. We have a spectrum of geological processes which give rise to mud. On the one hand, we may have mud forming at high temperatures, so this is mud 
forming in the surface expression of uh, hydrothermal systems in, in New Zealand. And you can see you know, the boiling mud pools, which are very attractive in terms of demonstrating the vigor of these reactions. And we can see the mud there, and everyone's going ooh and ah, but we turn the soundtrack off on purpose. If I can move on, we can see the consequences of that when we're able to dig down beneath where that type of water rock interaction is taking place. And in this particular case, this is a photograph of part of the, the China clay mining area of Cornwall, near St. Austell. It's quite an old photograph. It wouldn't look like that now, but the overall impression of the geology would be the same. And that is a very, very substantial areas of what started out as granite being turned into effectively mud with quartz sand distributed through it. So it feels like gravel, a sort of sticky gravel. But you can easily break it up with a hose. And you can see down here below the, the question mark a hose playing on the material to break it up. And then it's flowing away down uh, to a sump where it gets sucked out. This is not something you'd see these days other than in a museum. Because when this was taken, there'd be a, a little man in that two meter high cabinet steering the hose to make sure that the clay was moved and the, the, the face was washed in an appropriate way. Now that, if we were to put back the clay, would look something like this. We'd have a tour of some kind, and the clay would have been removed from around the tour over time. If we were to look at this in a less advanced stage, we'd find the remains of tours. And there may still be remains of tours waiting to be exposed by human activity and where the, the hose hasn't yet reached. So, <coughs> pardon me. With this, we've got weathering taking place of the silicate minerals. And that weathering may be the finishing touch. And indeed, in southwest England, although we can see the relics of weathering physically like this in the tours, there's a lot of argument about the weathering or hydrothermal origin of the clay itself. And this is something which has been particularly interesting. I don't think it's a finished story yet. But you can find evidence of hydrothermal activity being associated with the formation of these clay deposits. And equally, you can find evidence of weathering having been involved in their formation. So to some extent, you can pay your money and take your choice. But that would be a separate lecture. It would take quite a long time to argue and show both sides of those arguments. So when we come to have a look at how the rock-forming minerals which characterize igneous rocks have behaved and might behave in a weathering sequence, we go back to something which is venerable and ancient the Golditch reaction series. This was an uh, observation showing that olivine is the least resistant of the iron and magnesium bearing minerals, silicate minerals, followed by pyroxene, then amphibole, then biotite. And then on the right hand side, we see the two plagioclase feldspars, calcium plagioclase and sodium plagioclase. And those coming together with feldspar, potassium feldspar, muscovite, and quartz is the most resistant of the silicate minerals. This was based on observation, just simply noting which minerals lasted longest when soils were developing uh, on rocks that contain those minerals. But it's based on very sound thermodynamics. I'm not going to inflict the thermodynamics on you, but you can write chemical reactions for the decomposition of each of these, and they demonstrate the energy change involved in those reactions. So yes, indeed, olivine is the least stable. And the observations that were made were perfectly correct. And why not, after all? We have a saying uh, that uh, one of our previous presidents said, uh, the rocks never lie, and indeed the soils never lie. Observations are there, if correctly and accurately recorded. They don't lie. They just need to make, we just need to make sure that we interpret them correctly. Now, in this context, if you want to see where clay minerals come, perhaps the closest we can get is to say, well, muscovite chemically is an analog for illite, one of the families of clay minerals, as I'll show you shortly. And so if we put clay minerals in this sequence, then this is where they would lie. And so we would see that in soils and the weathering profiles developed on most igneous rocks, you're going to end up with quartz if quartz is present and clay minerals. And then perhaps if it's a young uh, weathering profile without having gone to completion, you might find some clay feldspar present. So the weathering reactions that develop clays then are well understood and long established. As those reactions take place, then the critical thing that they do from the point of view of soils and the ability of a clay to function in a chemical way is that they release different nutrients. 
So we find that olivine and the pyroxenes principally will be releasing magnesium, which is a vital nutrient for plants and animals. And then iron, maybe not so important uh, for plants, but still this is one of the common sources for iron. Amphiboles, we have those two again, but with calcium added in. Biotite, perhaps a major source of iron in weathering, but magnesium and then potassium, which we ought to maybe add to that list. The plagioclase feldspars will be giving us calcium and sodium. The potassium feldspars, potassium, muscovite potassium. But of course, quartz, being the most stable of all these minerals, is not giving us anything at all. And that reflects in this reaction series where we've got the principal trend here of the elements which are released in weathering, calcium and sodium on that side, iron and magnesium on that side, and then potassium coming into this area here of release. And the function then of the clay minerals, like muscovite, is that they're actually not just acting as a supply of nutrients, but they're, they're buffering the nutrients. They're acting through cation exchange capacity. A clay will react with the water in which it sits to make sure that the cations that are present in that water are kept as a constant concentration relative to one another. And that's done by adjusting the cation content of the clay itself. Some clays are good at that, some clays are bad at that. But it's a vital role that these elements play. And of course, the other thing to bear in mind with this is that we're seeing these reactions reflecting the crystal structure of these minerals. So these are all silicate minerals. And here we've got isolated silica tetrahedra, single chains, double chains, triple chain, uh, sheets, I should say. And then the three-dimensional networks of feldspar and quartz. And here, three-dimensional networks of aluminium present in them uh, to varying extents, more aluminium here than here. And what we're seeing is a reflection of the stability of that lattice. So the crystal lattice is breaking down and the stability series reflects the, the geometry and extent of covalent bonding within that silicate lattice. So the igneous minerals, which are formed in proper volcanoes as opposed to mud volcanoes, they weather and break down. And what gets left behind is the silica, or alumina that they contain. We'll look at that concept of being left behind in a minute. But the critical thing is that clays are formed. Then cations are lost to solution. They may be captured by clay minerals and other exchange sites by cation exchange. And then we have the cation exchange reactions, particularly controlling potassium as one of the key nutrients that is required in soils. So the behavior of clays in soils is vital to their function in terms of being able to support plant life. So in soils, we have mineral weathering, which might take potassium out of fixed sources in feldspars and unweathered micas, going to an exchangeable site in a weathered mica and on clay minerals that might be newly formed, through to solution. And from the plant's perspective, the plant roots are eating this bit here, the available potassium in solution, which then draws upon the exchangeable potassium. So that happens relatively quickly. And the critical thing is how to get this bit to work quickly. How can we get feldspars to feed into that exchangeable K sufficiently rapidly to help meet the needs of the plant? That's a whole area of research, which I, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to talk about at length here. But what I will do is show you what happens when that reaction is well in the swing of it. This here is a rock called a cyanite, which is 100% feldspar to start with. And yet you look at it now. And you see that it's got these brown cores of less weathered material, which is where there's enough iron in it to give it a stain. And then you've got the white of kaolinite, a clay mineral, running down through joints. And interestingly enough, in this particular case, these joints are full of roots of plants that are growing up above. So there's an intimate coexistence of the, the plant root and the clay mineral in this. It is clay mineral forming at the present time. What we don't know is whether the plant roots have helped these clay minerals to form or whether they're just taking advantage of it. But that's uh, one can hypothesize over that. And uh, trying to prove it in the field is extremely difficult, but never mind. What we do know is the chemical reaction that's taking place. So we've got here a, a chemical reaction written simply in terms of the chemistry of what's going on. But what's more important is to translate that into what the mineralogical reactions are and how those work out. So we're starting off with feldspar, which is what this rock was made of to begin with. And we can see demonstrably from the outcrop that we've got residual kaolinite, 
This is a chemical formula of kaolinite. Note how simple it is, and we'll test you on this later. But just aluminium and silicon, a little bit of water. And then to the soil solution, what is being released is potassium and silica. And that's what these roots are after. And you have to remember that in a lot of plants, obviously potassium is a micronutrient, but a crop, be it sugar cane, as it might be in this case, or wheat closer to home, is 1% potassium, 1% silica. Those plants need silica to, to grow. And so this weathering of a primary rock forming mineral to give a clay not only liberates the, the, the more normally considered fertilizer components, but it's also giving a, a central component to minerals, uh, to, to, to plant growth in the mineral content of the plant in terms of what the biologist describes as minerals. Now, when we come closer to home, because that picture was in Brazil, where tropical weathering is, is much more rapid than temperate weathering, and we go instead to Tynemouth, where it's a bit cold, we can see sandstones of this type here, where we've got the mineralogy is slightly different, and we've got a, a more complicated chemical formula here with potassium in it, which is illite. It's effectively the muscovite chemical formula, but written here to represent illite as the clay mineral that's formed. So again, we've got the feldspar breaking down, and that's demonstrable with water, and of course, it's a key reactant that drives that reaction to give us illite and silica again going into the soil solution. But we're not seeing the potassium being released at this stage yet it is exchangeable, so we've got the possibility of uh, acting as a reservoir of relatively rapidly available potassium, which helps support plant growth. And this is one reason why in the Northern Hemisphere we, we, we depend so much on the application of chemical fertilizers. It's because these mineralogical reactions are very slow in the soils that we have in the North. And if, it, if you go to Brazil, they happen much faster in tropical soils. These reactions are sufficiently rapid that you can actually <laughs> use some of these minerals as sources of plant nutrients without having to worry too much about how quickly uh, how they're, they're reacting. You don't have to worry about them breaking down fast enough. They, they do break down fast enough to be accessible to plants. Now, those were some of the chemical aspects and characteristics of some of the clay minerals. Um, we have a look at the physical characteristics, and we see that clays do some interesting things. So they, they shrink and they swell, and this cauliflower-like texture here is something which indicates the clay bentonite as a, as a bulk material, smectite-rich clays, where they're, they're swelling in this particular case. So this is a clay that, if it dried out completely, we might see a nice flat environment here, a nice flat puddle with maybe even mud cracks in it. But there's been some rain. It's got sufficiently wet for those clays to start to swell. And there's not enough space in that puddle for them to swell uh, and, and to swell out and make the puddle bigger. They've been constrained by the edge of the puddle. And so we see this cauliflower-like texture because it's sort of erupting on the surface. Uh, so there was rather a peculiar texture there, but absolutely distinctive of, of the bentonite clays and smectite clays in, in the soil. What you would definitely not want to do is have your house built on a clay that does this because, of course, the consequences would be that it would swell in one part more than another. Your house would tilt, the foundations would be damaged, and there'd be no end of problems. So bentonites, which are the bulk commodity clay that consists of smectites, have this as an inherent problem. They, they, they shrink and they swell. That brings benefits in some cases, but disbenefits if you know, you've got them in your foundations or if you don't want to have a swelling clay around. Where are they used? Well, they are used in drilling, and this is a, a shallow drill, which is using a, a drilling fluid, as you can see. Um, this is actually a biodegradable drilling fluid, so it's not causing any harm, even though it might look pretty disgusting on the surface of the ground here. It's just going to be washed away with a hose and not cause any problems. But this is where the fluid that is surrounding the bit is being used to help transport cuttings up the well, to help the well to function in terms of being able to collect the core or the cuttings or whatever it is you have to have out of that well. And here, the addition of bentonite is one of the components of this fluid is there to help affect its viscosity so that it performs as it should do. Now, that's a shallow site investigation, but when we are drilling deeper, here we have a, a drilling rig in the middle of the city of Newcastle on a two-kilometer deep hole for geothermal work. This is one where mud is absolutely vital, where the bentonite addition to mud is absolutely vital to enable this venture to work. The, this is what it looks like. So in the mud pit on the rig where it's circulating, it looks pretty foul, but that is the most sophisticated thing you can imagine. And the amount of work that the drillers put into getting that just right, by adding just the right amount of such and such a chemical or another chemical, bentonite being one of the chemicals that goes into the mix, 
vital to enable this hole to be recovered because what was needed to be done was to send a drill bit down there to clean out an open hole and to make sure that the side of the hole was stable with no cavings coming in. There's nothing a driller likes less than putting an expensive drill string down and finding that you can't pull it out again because of all of the holes have caved in on it. And so getting that mud right was vital to keep the hole open so that then the operation could continue and the hole be cased so it can be used as a well. A borehole ceased to be a borehole, it became a well. And that was achieved entirely by the juggling around with the chemistry and composition of the mud that was circulating. So very impressed by the ability of the drilling engineer to use clays to get out of a problem. Well, rock weathering then leads to the formation of a whole host of different clay minerals which have properties that differ. Some of them are chemically useful to us, some of them are mechanically and physically useful to us. And just to quickly sum those up, kaolinite, that's the one I said I'd test you on earlier. Very simple chemical composition, aluminium, silicon, oxygen and water, white in colour. Illite has got all those, but it's got potassium as well. More complicated with potassium as an exchangeable cation. The spec types, these are ones where, when dealing with students, one never writes the formula down on the board because it's very difficult to remember what the formula is for me, and even more difficult for them, because it's so complex. The chemistry is extremely variable. These are the ones that, by virtue of their chemistry and their structure, show shrink and swell behavior, and they show absorption. They're very, very good at absorbing all sorts of different polar molecules and solvents and cations. So they're perhaps the most complex of the clay mineral family. And chlorite, for uh, completeness here, is a clay that's important in some of, the, some of the carboniferous mudstones of the north of England and others where it, it comes into brick making as a useful ingredient in the, in the, in the clay. Uh, but here it's a simple formula. It's colored by a large chloros green gives you a hint that it is related to the green colour that you see in metamorphic rocks where chloride as a mica type of mineral is, is prominent. So we don't only get the formation of the clay minerals, but of course we get the pigmenting minerals as well, the iron oxides. And sometimes these can be quite luridly red. So it's the same as the colour of the handle here. This is red iron oxide covering a, a clay, whereas in this Brazilian example here, this is a, a brown iron oxide. The mineralogy of that iron oxide gives you the pigment that's there in the clay itself. And that can be quite important. We'll come back to the pigment later on in the talk. Having formed our clays, where do they go? Well, here we may have a, a soil, and you can see erosion in the soil due to heavy rain, and that's the quickest and easiest way of degrading a soil, of losing the clay minerals that have formed, simply by having rain and not managing the soil to capture the downflow that particular material. Further down that particular field, you can see the sediment is in fact precipitating out, or settling out, I should say, settling out, and the plough direction runs across that. So that will get incorporated back in the field. That won't get lost. That's normal heavy rainfall. But when we have exceptionally heavy rainfall and we've got floods, you can see if we're carrying logs of this type down a rapidly moving river, then we're taking a lot of clay as well at the same time. The energy in this system is sufficient to take a lot of mineral matter as well. And anyone who's had the misfortune to have been hit by flooding will know perfectly well that the smudge that's left in your house after the floods have receded is mud. It's the clay that's come from the soil or wherever it happens to come along from. And it's picked up a whole pile of other nasty things beside it. So you end up with deposition. And here you can see the, the nature of the mud, a goopy mud with lots of organic matter going into it at the same time. This is uh, the material which then is going to start to enter the geological record. And the Anthropocene. It's going to be so interesting, isn't it, to come back in a couple of million years' time and see what paleontologists make of things like this. The, 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 our, our signal will be quite uh, significant, I suspect, in mudstones in the future. Now, when we have a look at the loss of clays, of mud, of soil, from the air, you can see that very, very large areas can be affected. And here's an example where you can see pristine forest over here, and areas which have been cleared. And you can see just how much bare ground there is. Uh, it's a tropical area, and so the, the color of the ground is like that in Brazil, but this isn't Brazil, but you can see the, the way in which the soil is bare, and it's entering into the rivers. The river systems here are running with the color of the soil. So you see a river looking something like this, 
a river in a, 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 a pristine rainforest would not be as full of sediment as this. It's much more likely to be dominated by organic matter, or even be clear in some cases. But this is the material that's being carried away as a consequence of deforestation upstream. And these rivers can be enormous, and they carry their load round and round and round out to sea, where you can see the front which might form where the clay-bearing material eventually reaches a point with the sea, its interaction with seawater, so that the clays start to drop out and enter into the sediment once more. So this is going several kilometers away from shore, that clays are being exported into the marine environment as a consequence of human-induced deforestation. So that's a big problem, because what it's doing is it's leading to the loss and destruction of soil, which is particularly embarrassing for me as a professor of soil science, because this is, of course, the International Year of Soils as well as the Year of Mud. So we have to bear in mind that we want to pay attention to stopping that geological process starting. We want to make sure that we keep our soils where they need to be to support the plant growth, which eventually we depend on for our food and other raw materials. So where does it go? Well, when it ends up in the marine environment and it's settling out and accumulating on the ocean floor, then we see what we like as geologists. We see rocks. And the nice thing about seeing a sequence of rocks of this type is that we can put labels on it and see what it is. We've got a mudstone, and as many mudstones, this one here has got concretions, carbonate and other minerals forming concretions in the mudstone. It's a delight for a geologist to have a look at an outcrop like this, to take it to bits, to look at it in uh, various scales, uh, particularly when you start to look at it in thin section and under the electron microscope to see what the textures are that are there and the stories that this rock has to tell. Well, this sort of rock has value, potentially has value. Mudstones of this type have value in a number of different ways. They may act as sources of metals. And in this particular case, this is from the same outcrop as I've just shown you. The reason it's a bit blurred is it's quite a high power magnification. And these individual grains here are clay size, so they're maybe 10 microns across, something like that. What are they? The bright ones, this is reflective light. These are galena, the lead sulfide mineral. And this is sphalerite, the zinc sulfide mineral. So here we have a cliff which has got sphalerite and galena that's actually in these concretions. And you think, where on earth did that come from? And what's going to happen to it? So the question is, is this actually a source of mineralization that's waiting to be cooked up down below and to liberate lead and zinc to go off to form mineral deposits somewhere else? Or is it indeed an ore deposit in its own right that can be mined as an ore deposit in its own right? So it's one of those curiosities that one finds on the coast in Northumberland from time to time and can't explain. It's more normal to think of the economic value of mudstones in terms of their value in producing petroleum. Mudstones inherently are rich in organic matter, and that organic matter in burial will give you petroleum gas, petroleum liquids. These form through the maturation of, oil, of, of, of organic matter in the mudstone. And these organic rich mudstones, typically very black, so here's a good one in Yorkshire. Uh, the slide accurately reproduces the colors. But otherwise, they may be oxidized if they're exposed at the surface. But a sequence of mudstones through burial and heating can generate the petroleum raw materials, which then work their way through to traps and can be released by petroleum exploitation in the fullness of time. We also see an association between muds and coal. So we can see here a coal seam an open cast mine, and here are the sandstone standing out nice and proud. But all this grey stuff, the boring stuff, is actually probably the most interesting stuff. It's the, it's the mud that's there in that sequence. And then where we see, in some places, a closer association between the coal and the underlying clay, we can see here uh, a kaolin-rich clay, a sea turf, which has got the roots of the plants which grew to give us that coal. So these are ancient soils which are preserved in the preservation of the coal-bearing sequence. Very, very close link between mudstones, muds, clays, and fossil fuels. Now, mud itself has value as a raw material. So it's not just what it's associated with and what that might give rise to. We can find clay minerals themselves inherently valuable as raw materials in their own right. So we mine clay, we bag clay, and we sell clay. And that is underpinning a large part of the minerals economy, and that's what I'm going to move on to now. 
we might want to mine mud itself. And this here is an example of mud being mined in a quarry where the working place is just over a metre high. There's a drain here to make sure that when it rains, the working place doesn't get flooded completely. You can see the length of the working place is quite substantial and the machinery that is taking that out. That clay is being taken out, that mud's being taken out as a source of brick clay. It's hired to make bricks and tiles. Holland. Holland is the place where that was photographed. No hills to speak of in that part of Holland. So you can see the need for a quarry to have a rather different geometry to a quarry that you might have in this country where you might be able to uh, take advantage of the topographic variation that we have here. But brick making is an ancient profession. And making bricks from mud is currently practiced in the north of India and many other parts of the world. This is mud from paddy fields that would grow rice at the appropriate time of the year. When the rice harvest is over, the mud is taken away and shaped, made into clamps and fired to, to make bricks. And this will have been a process that's been going on like this for thousands of years. And for those of you who are interested, of course, note that the people who are doing all the work are the women. The men are sitting out there in a cafe enjoying themselves, but the women are doing all the work in handling and making these bricks. But the beauty of brick making is that it gives you a very, very robust product. So even when you're looking at ancient bricks, which might be 18th century like these, they're still there, they're still providing their function, they're still working and serving the purpose for which they were intended. And yet when we look at bricks in modern construction, we can see that they are used in modern houses. Reused, reclaimed and recycled bricks are used to give a certain vernacular look which is attractive. And then other bricks of different colours. So in some parts of the country where you might have a very kaolin rich clay, you can get a very pale coloured brick for your house. It creates all sorts of interesting difficulties for how to get the colour right for the bricks. And we'll come on to that shortly. Because the, the colour that gives you the variation in pigment for the bricks is based on hematite. And this image shows the red colour of a brick in thin section. And it's an unusual way of observing a brick in thin section because it's a polished thin section observed in reflected light under cross polars. And that really brings out the colour of the pigments very nicely. So you can see that it's disseminated evenly throughout the brick as a very, very colourful dissemination, for lack of a better word. But sometimes we want our clay to be white, snow white, the whiter the better. And thankfully there are clays which are snow white in the field and you can mine those and produce a snow white clay from them. Why? It's because we want to print things like this, the geoscientist, other glosses. It's absolutely vital for the production of nice colour printing of the type that we all take for granted in our glossy magazines that we have a good clay coating of paper and that clay coated paper then because of the clay and the function of the clay is able to take a high quality lithogravia printed product. And that, that is the Rolls-Royce of clays at work there in that. Absolutely vital. So when we're looking at clay properties, we're thinking about whiteness and brightness. Now obviously, as a party of students here, brightness is very difficult to assess. Uh, but whiteness of the clay is relatively easy. And you can do this for yourselves at home. If you just look at the colour of different glossy papers and different magazines, you'll see that the whiteness varies from one magazine to another. It's the clay and the whites of the clay that's being used there. And most will be very high quality, but maybe some of the poorer quality printing that you might get from uh, outside the UK, outside Europe, you might find that uh, the, the, the colour is a little bit off, not quite what you would like. Clays themselves in the ground normally vary. And this is an example here of, of, of ball clay production near Newton Abbott in Devon, where you can see the grey and the black are seams of lignite, or organic rich clay. There's a continuous spectrum between lignite and a good quality clay. So here the mining of this has to be done very, very carefully to take out one seam at a time. And each seam has its own properties for firing and being turned into a ceramic product. And this is the raw material that goes into heavy ceramics like sanitary ware, kitchen sinks, things like that. That's what this clay is good for. And colour isn't quite so important. And as you will no doubt have seen, you, know, you break a tile you break the corner of a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink, and you see it's, it's a buff colour, not a snow white colour. So that's what, uh, that's what these clays yield when fired. And the variation colour can actually get, get quite tricky. This is in Georgia, in the southeast United States. Here, a very red clay, which is a real problem. If you wanted to get a white clay, and there's a white clay down here, you've got to make absolutely sure when you're mining it, you don't let that contaminate that. But that 
is extremely valuable by virtue of its whiteness and brightness. That's a clay which uh, will, will, will get a very high price and allow particular functions to be carried out in its use. So when we look at the price, this is a way of envisaging how uh, much the relative costs of these things are. We might start off with a brick clay, which basically is the price that it cost us to dig it out of the ground. So let's estimate that's about five pounds a tonne, something like that. A fire clay, a little bit more expensive because you've got to move more overburden to be able to create the fire clay. Bentonites, we're jumping up into the 40 pound a tonne sort of mark there. Ceramic clays, maybe 50. Fillers, up to 70 pounds a tonne. Cat litter, maybe 80 pounds a tonne. Porcelain clays, going up to nearly 100. And then these paper coating clays, 150 pounds a tonne. So they're the Rolls Royce. They're the clays which have the highest sale price and value. And what this reflects is the amount of processing that goes into making these things. So here, it's very simply a case of just digging it out. If it's the right color, then it'll be fine. It'll give you a, a nice colored brick and you can use it. But here, there's a lot of mineral processing to give you a paper coating clay that performs a particular function. And that's largely based on getting the right particle size and shape so that when it goes into a paper making machine, it can be applied to paper that's moving underneath the blade at several kilometers an hour. A very, very rapid movement of paper underneath the blade that this paper clay is applied to. Now, we get color appearing in this, whiteness being the key parameter here that allows you to have the highest price. Bricks down here, color does matter, and you end up with the need to supply a palette of brick colors because. If you're a builder, you want to make sure that if you're building a housing estate like this, you get the same colour for all the houses, or at least if you want different colours that it's consistent. And we've all seen how difficult it is to match bricks in an extension. If you want to build an extension onto a house that might have been built 10 or 20 years ago, because the clay is different, and the clays that you're able to use for firing the bricks are no longer there. So you can't get precisely the same match of clay colour. So brick makers will produce a palette of bricks, which they will then through the builder's merchants, show to the architects. The architects will choose from a palette of brick colours in the same way that you might choose house colours or colours of paint for painting inside a house. It all depends on the clay. This is where some of the chlorite rich clays come in from the north of England because they, they help to provide a clay that is uh, of this colour, whereas down here, this one's in southwest England, there's very much more a ball clay type of clay that's been used. So all sorts of different ways in which these different clays get used for different products and the end product being the house in which we live. But when we look at these diverse products, here we have examples, of course, of bricks, of ceramic clay products, and of the type of thing which the paper coating clay goes into. I mentioned the geoscientists. Of course, geoscientist is something which you keep on your bookcase for years and go back and consult. Whereas these things, which are what you find on your mat when you open your front door, uh, fireworks and advertisements, uh, advertisements for this, that, and the other, how long do they last? I mean, you, you take one glance and they go into the paper recycling. And the paradox is, of course, that that's the most expensive clay that has enabled that printing to be done. So you wouldn't get these brochures if you didn't have 150 pound a tonne clay to go into them and make them. So it's kind of paradoxical because when you look at their lifetimes, and here, this is the life scale here, 200 years for, for bricks. Yes, why not? You know, bricks normally last that long or longer. Ceramics might last 100 years, depending on whether you grate them or not. And then this lot down here, well, a day if it's lucky. You know, it's used, it goes through your letterbox, and it's then in the recycling, when the next opportunity to recycle this. So we have a paradox here that the most valuable clays are the ones which last least long as a consumer product. And is that sustainable? How does that tie into the way we, we use raw materials? These are questions which uh, go outside the scope of this lecture, but it's something that you can think about when next time you do your paper recycling. The paradox of clays is what comes out. So we've been through a few of the things which make me interested in clays and in mud, and I hope that I've been able to show you some evidence that I like to think of, well, where would we be without it? It's a vital thing, and uh, the, we, we depend on it for our soils and for raw materials also, and for our fuels. So mud is something which human beings can't live without, and that makes it very easy then for us to have a year of mud. I would like to suggest that mud could be the longest running show in geological time. But I'm quite sure that there are those who take an interest in the ancient history, the deep earth history of this planet, who would perhaps uh, uh, venture to disagree with that. But uh, it's certainly a long running show, and long may we enjoy it. So, the year of mud, look forward 
to what's going to happen this year because you'll find reference to mud over and over again in the calendar of activities that the society has during the year. And what has been so fascinating to see is the way in which those who decide on our calendar have risen to the challenge of exploring the delights of mud from a whole range of different perspectives. That's something that we've all got to look forward to, and I hope I've been able to whet your appetites a little bit with this starter today. Thank you. Well, David says he'll ask some questions. Yes. So I'll try with chair. Who would like to ask a question about mud? Away. There's a microphone coming. Yeah, here it comes, yes, thank you. That's okay. Thank you for all that. Can you please explain the term ball clay? Ball clay, yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, can I explain the term ball clay? And um, the, 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 the accepted wisdom is that this is clay that forms a ball as it's handled. So it's sort of extracted from the ground as a lump with spades in the old days when people used manual tools for this. And it got moved around on trolleys and wheelbarrows and things like that. So by the time it ended up being loaded onto a railway wagon or a truck or a cart or something like that, the corners were rubbed off and it was a nice ball. That's the story. And I'm going to perpetuate it. Uh, before I throw this away, <laughs> can you tell me where this fits into the uh, uh, quality of coating? Oh, yes. Well, it will be a very high quality. It's quite a thick paper, though, so it's got a filler in it, and the chances are that's a calcium carbonate filler, and that the purpose of the filler is to make sure that you can't see through from one side to the other of the page. But the surface coating, if you took a, a cross-section of that paper, you'd see a nice layer of the best quality kerenite as the surface coating. I'll keep it a bit longer. Yes. <laughs> Up in the front here. Um, during the recycling, how effectively is the coating actually removed from a glossy magazine? I think that's a, a million dollar question. How easily can we remove the coating from a glossy magazine? And I think the answer is you can't at the present time. So it's one of the things that the companies that produce these clays are looking at to see if they can recover it. But regrettably, it's, um, a, a, to the best of my knowledge, it's impossible to do at the present time, which is a great shame. And so the question then is, well, what else can you do with that paper? Because you end up with a sludge. And so some of that paper sludge is applied to land as a way of helping build organic matter in land. Uh, but the other possibility is, well, yeah, you, you may be able to use it as a, a material when it's fired. And of course, one of the ways we can all see the mineral content of these papers from glossy magazines and the like is if we burn them on an open fire, you're, you're left with the substance of that mineral that remains. And that might be one way of... Uh, recovering the mineral in a different form. But it, it was very early days to, to know how that's going to work out. Oh, I'll ask a question. To what, to what extent is the UK self-sufficient in various types of tubes? Well, that does vary a lot. I mean, for a brick clay, we, we necessarily are self-sufficient because it's simply too expensive to move it around given the the inherent value of the material itself. So in parts of Stoke-on-Trent, for example, um, areas which are underlain by Etruria Marl are protected so that one can go in and mine Etruria Marl in the future. Um, so it's, it's a strategic reserve. Uh, but the, um, with the paper coating clays, those trade globally. And this is one of the issues with the production of paper coating clays from Cornwall, is that it's competing with paper coating clay on a global market from Brazil. And that, that actually then creates problems uh, in terms of being able to get a high value for a product from Cornwall that competes with a similar product but might be cheaper from a different type of geology in, in Brazil. So it does vary with cat litter and things like that, with Fuller's Earth. I mean, Fuller's Earth is no longer mined in this country, I believe, if I'm correct in saying that. And that used to be a source of a very simple type of cat litter. So now we have to import the corresponding material. So it varies. It depends on the clay. Sudden flurry, right. This is the lady with the red scarf. <laughs> yes. uh, if you want to, uh, the question is, what's London clay? London clay is the stratigraphic name for the clay that underlies London and the vicinity of London. Uh, so it is a clay in its own right, 
but the, the, the association of the words London and clay there are the historical way of naming that particular rock. So throughout the geological sequence, you'll find that there are clays which have place names attached to them, and the geologist recognizes the association of those two to tell us what the age is. It doesn't tell us a huge amount, necessarily, about the precise detail of what that clay is made of, although there are patterns that vary with the age of the clay. Uh, am I right in thinking that the clays you're talking about, they come in different consistencies? Some of them will be sticky mud and some of them will be hard, compressed rocks. Is, is, is that correct? Yes. Uh, the clays do come in a wide range of consistencies. So the, the material that's deposited, like the one with the bike in it and the car tire in it, that, that is really gloopy, gooey stuff. It's got a lot of water in it. And what happens is that as this gets buried, the water gets squeezed out. And so in that one which had the galena and sphalerite in it, that it was evidence that it may have lost perhaps half of the thickness of the goo by virtue of losing the water. So they do compress and get harder as they get buried. And so with something like a, a, a brick clay, you've got a choice effectively between a clay that might be like a glacial till, so that's still quite soft and gooey and malleable, uh, which is used or has been used historically as a source of, of brick clay, which isn't used so much now or a clay that is a rock that still needs to be then ground up and turned into a paste to be made into a brick. So there's a whole spectrum there. Um, I don't know if uh, it's still used now, but um, I remember um, kaolin was used as a poultice for, for treating um, things like pneumonia and yeah. chest conditions. Was there any, is there any kind of genuine medical benefits in using Well, there are, there are all sorts of uses for kaolin, which are medicinal, so it does have medicinal benefits. Um, obviously, kaolin and morphine is something we eat when you've got tummy trouble, and kaolin provides a purpose there. Um, you can, in fact, in some parts of the world, um, eat bentonite in the same way, and bentonite has quite the opposite effect. So bentonite is sold for its ability to clean you out. Uh, <laughs> but I don't believe that can be used legally in this country, so, so there are various... Uh, but yeah, people do use uh, clays as poultices still. It's, it's, it's a valid point. Is there anything special about the clays that artists use for modelling? Yes, I th that, that's a, a very interesting question. I mean, they, they will go for clays which have the particular firing properties that they need. And if, if it's a clay going through to a fired product in the sculpture, then yes, uh, the clay will be quite carefully uh, prepared and designed for that purpose. And that would then be quite a, an expensive product if it's not right. So yes, so there are special, special preparations required there. How would you differentiate a mud to a mudstone? Uh, well, the, <laughs> how do I compare a mud to a mudstone? A mud would be unconsolidated, so a mud would be soft, whereas a mudstone would be hard. So the test would be if the geologist can hit it with a hammer and what happens if it goes splat, it's a mud, and it's a mud, if it goes ding, it's a mudstone. But that's rather a crude way of putting it. Um, one wouldn't necessarily use a hammer for that purpose. But yeah, it's, it would be the, um, the degree of hardness. Any other? David, can I add to your reply to the yes, comments please. about the medicinal clays? Because there's a, there's, in, in France, there's a book about fat on the uses of... Uh, green clays, and um, there's a lot of research in France into the use of, of iron-rich clays, and they found that they're very beneficial in, in Africa for, you, for treating the flesh-eating uh, mm. diseases. The, um, the, the healing is, is quite remarkable, and this is good, good clay science published in Clays yes. and Clay Minerals, yes. and um, there's a group in, in Georgia and USA as well working on that, so okay. it really is a, a, there's a lot of very exciting stuff being done with inhibiting Bacteria. Well, thank you for that. Yes, I, I need to read more. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, well, I'll do my second question. Oh, Can we right. ex extraterrestrial, David? Oh, yes. On, on Mars, we know there were lakes and rivers. <laughs> what sort of clays would have formed on Mars? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? Yes. Well, uh, uh, yeah, there's only one answer to that, and that is the same type of clay as you'd get forming on uh, on this planet, because of course the rules of physics and chemistry are the same wherever you go, and so you would end up with the clays that were appropriate for the chemistry of the weathering 
reactions which were appropriate. So, and it depends on the substrate. So, what rocks are we starting with on Mars? And so we would, you know, we might have areas of lava flow where you might expect uh, basaltic lavas to give you a smet-type rich clay, and, and that's a possibility. I don't know whether or not we'd have found evidence of shrinkage and swellage in Mars with the mapping that's been done. It may be that this is something which we wouldn't expect to find without having picked up evidence from orbiting spacecraft. But then it would almost certainly be the case that one would find kaolinite. I'd certainly put my money on kaolinite on Mars. I'm sticking my neck out, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. Is clay very good for tunneling through? I think uh, there are certainly people in the audience who can answer that question better than I can. Uh, some clays are and some clays aren't, is what I would suspect is the answer. But of course, uh, a clay is inherently a soft rock compared to the sandstone or something like that. So it's relatively easy to tunnel through, but then the difficulty would be whether it can support the aperture that you've created. So that, that would be the key issue. May I step in a bit? Yes, please. The London clay is very good for tunnels. And that's why the tube system, we have a round tube tunnel, are mainly north of the river. Because that's where the London clay is. It's, it's less of its sand. Where we don't have tube systems. We have our southern part of the <laughs> southern part of the that And tunneling developed in industry, working through the clay of the London clay, which you can do with a spade. Sounds like we're uh, ready for the next one. David, thank, thank, thank you. you very much for an excellent. Thank you very much. I, I checked beforehand, and I'm told that there's wine waiting for us.